Okay. All right, everyone, uh, welcome back. If you can uh, take your seats so that we can kick off for the, the last session um, of the day. Last, but by no means least. Um, and just to, to, to give you a quick overview, this session is, is really all about the lessons learned and also the future prospects of, of projects that have essentially been funded by the European Commission. Um, and I'm actually going to hand over um, to Panos Balabalis, um, who is going to, to lead this session. So you'll be in his very capable hands. Um, so I'm going to step to one side and Panos, the floor is yours. Thank you and over to you. Thank you very much, um, Fiona. Thank you also uh, for your attention. I think this is one of the last uh, sessions before the closing. So it's a pleasure also to um, have here a very distinguished panel of um, people working on the European project, but also uh, people also coming from, uh, in particular, also the US. So this is the session that we are going also to um, showcase uh, some examples of uh, type of projects that we are supporting in the context of the Horizon 2020, which is the current framework for research and innovation. And then we'll also complement these presentations with uh, two other um, uh, funding programs and to have also to see how uh, this project is also dealing about water-related innovation and how they can also uh, tell us, you know, about the, the lessons learned. So without taking more of your time, I would like, let's say, first of all, also to um, kindly invite Werner um, Brock also to join us. Uh, Werner, who um, works now at the, um, um, works in the uh, Helmut Center for Environment Research in Lipsit, has been working a lot on issues also related to uh, emerging also pollutants. And I think uh, Werner has very uh, good outcomes from different projects supported outcomes which have also very nice policy implications. So, Werner, the floor is yours. Well, thanks a lot for that nice introduction and good afternoon to all of you. So, there have been even more people this morning, but uh, it's good that you are here. And, well, it's a pleasure for me uh, to be here in this uh, really exciting and interesting uh, conference. And it's also a pleasure that I have the opportunity to tell you a bit more about the, pro uh, the project I was coordinating, Solutions for Present and Future Emerging Pollutants, and there is a little bit more words on that. So it's about emerging pollutants, and I'm quite happy that Norbert already explained a bit about it, so you have already uh, an idea in mind. So let's have a look on the background. So we already heard a lot about the ambitions of EU policy. So the Water Framework Directive, of course, uh, that uh, tries to get a good quality uh, of all uh, European water bodies, the strategy for a non-toxic environment. We also have, of course, the zero pollution uh, strategy and so on. So I think really ambitious and uh, really highly appreciated. But let's also have a look uh, on the implementation. And we already heard water quality improved. Yes, that's true. That's no doubt. But still, I think there is uh, quite some room for improvement. And that was what we were do, uh, dealing with in solutions. So I think uh, if we have a look on the maps, so the ecological status maps or the chemical status maps, and we have uh, the Water Framework Directive in, uh, pro uh, well, in progress since uh, 2000, we see relatively limited progress in quality status, despite a lot of money that has been invested. So, and another point I see, I see relatively critical is that uh, the focus is very much, particularly of monitoring, is very much on the status, status monitoring, rather than finding solutions. And there is a relatively weak link between monitoring and management. So, um, <clears throat> and the last thing, and that's maybe the major point for solutions, is that many, many chemicals are ignored, all these uh, emerging pollutants, and the mixtures of them are ignored too. So what, is, uh, what did solutions do? We focused on monitoring and assessment of these mixtures. There is, it's called solution fo solutions focused. So we want to change something. Uh, then uh, on modeling, so we combine monitoring with modeling to fill gaps, to prioritize measures, and to calculate scenarios, so how can that be in future? And of course, we did a lot of policy recommendations for Water Framework Directive Review 2. So let's start with monitoring. So what we suggested is to 
combine effect-based monitoring with chemical screening of mixtures. So in order to really address the mixtures we have to minimize the risk to overlook hazardous chemicals, what we are doing at the moment quite intensively, to discover emerging compounds and to do a real prioritization of water bodies and measures what should we do first and what should we do later. If I have a look on the map, for example, of uh, chemical status in Germany, everything is red. That does not help. So we need to know what is better, what is worse, where do we need to, to act. And uh, all these suggestions, and particularly the, the effect-based monitoring suggestions, they also uh, well are discussed quite a lot, I think, in the uh, European Commission. There was even a working group, a, a WFD CIS working group, where we also uh, uh, contributed in order to prepare guidance. And uh, what you see here is just, uh, let's say, the test battery for effect-based monitoring we suggested, including in vivo assays and proxies for long-term effects, that means in vitro assays. So let's jump to the modeling because, uh, well, Monitoring always has some gaps. We cannot monitor everywhere. We cannot monitor every compound. We ca cannot monitor uh, at all places. So we developed a, a quite nice model train, let's say, to predict European scale emissions, exposure, and mixture risk, and to apply that really uh, on the European scale. We did that for 1,800 compounds. Uh, the outcome uh, is what you see there, no, it's, it doesn't work like that, but what you see here uh, on the map. Why do we do that? To bridge the monitoring gaps with respect to compounds, sites, time, and so on. To prioritize compounds and water bodies that should be monitored in a better way. To predict footprint reductions and uh, to do scenarios for, uh, well, decision support for the future. And uh, I think that's more or less my last slide. So a major focus, of course, was also on stakeholder dialogue and trying to come up with recommendation for water, water framework di uh, directive review. And I think the first thing I would like to show you here is, uh, let's say, one very general uh, overall result. And that is what you see here in that, uh, in that figure. So in collaboration with other, uh, uh, with other big EU projects, we found that, uh, well, toxicity, toxic chemicals, these toxic mixtures, not the priority pollutants, but the toxic mixtures, uh, they contribute about one third f uh, to the impaired ecological status, together with, uh, with uh, habitat and nutrients. Based on that finding, we did solutions policy briefs, which, uh, which came out uh, just recently, where we show all the different, uh, all the different uh, solutions, all the different uh, tools, we, have, we uh, produced a quite nice web-based tool to support Water Framework Directive implementation called Rebatox. And uh, of course, we had recommendations for enhanced consistency and feedback loops between uh, legislations, particularly on chemicals and on water quality. And I think that's, let's say, the last message and the major me message that came out uh, of the Water Framework Directive because we had a lot of discussions. Uh, well, shall we weaken it? Shall we strengthen it? What shall we do with it? Shall we skip it because it doesn't work? So there's also a lot of frustration around uh, with practitioners. And I think what we should do is really to empower the Water Framework Directive, which is a really unique legislation to prevent the risks of chemical pollution in European rivers and lakes. And to do so, we have to do it First of all, on, the, on a more holistic basis or not on the basis of few priority pollutants. And second, with having in mind that we want to change it, that we want to improve the water quality and not just define a bad status for the next 20 years as we had for the last 20 years. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Werner. I think very um, uh, interesting also presentation. Um, let's now... Um, pass to another uh, area. This is you know, climate. We talked to today about climate adaptation, the uh, possibilities, how we can help also uh, policymakers also to see the right path for adaptation. I would like then to uh, call to the podium also Anna Stella, uh, who is working at the uh, Hydraulic Environmental Laboratory in, 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 in Lisbon, also to tell us you know, experience about the bingo projects on climate adaptation. Thank you, Panos. 
Uh, first of all, I would like to say that I'm very, very pleased to be here at this very interesting conference and also very happy to understand how we have uh, reached to a similar conclusions, approaches and views. So I'm here to tell you something about BINGO. BINGO is or was an age 2020 project that just ended in September this year. Our main objective was to understand the impacts in the water cycle from climate change uh, um, in, the, in, the, in this near future. So for this, uh, we developed a work plan that was also quite innovative. First, we tackled uh, climate predictions for the near future. We, we used decadal climate predictions. We, in order to evaluate impacts in the water cycle, we use the combination of models that would allow us to understand not just what would come in surface water, but also in groundwater and in the soil, what is called the hidden part of the hydrological cycle. And taking all this information together with stakeholders, we developed adaptation strategies and solutions to some key socioeconomic activities. This is an overall of what we did and so much more I could say, but I invite you to visit the BINGO website. For now and today, I would like to bring here some three relevant key messages that we learned from this experience. First key message is that it's very important that research and knowledge is, is, is growing from real life, from real cases. We took BINGO, uh, all this work pro program was, was done at six research sites in different countries in Europe, from North Europe to South Europe, and different climatic conditions, six different languages, uh, and we were working together, researchers and stakeholders, since the very beginning of the project. We realized how important it is for researchers to have this dialogue, because then we can reach to a research that is valuable to these actors in society. It happens that sometimes researchers, if we are in our silos, in our offices or labs, we sometimes understand something that can be useful. But if we meet stakeholders and if we dialogue with them, we, we learn what is really needed at that moment. Also very relevant was that we could validate our solutions with them. We co-produce them together. Second key message, we can and we should make management and governance more adaptive. This means that uh, starting from very uh, good scientific knowledge, when we are implementing it in, in management guidelines or options or policies, we need to take into account that in society we have actors that have different levels of resources of preparedness and of capacities. So we should all engage them into following these policies and guidelines, but understanding that there will be always front runners and followers. So we should all move in the same direction and not requiring that everyone is at the same stage at the same time. Third and last key message. It has been addressed in this uh, today by several people is the power of communication. Because we can only start the grounds for negotiation and for collaborative action that are so crucial for water management and uh, to address climate change adaptation if we are able to communicate and collaborate with each other. And for this purpose, we can, we can bring some innovation to the structures we have because there are some cultural practices of communication between organizations and actors that can be improved. So if you have a, a better dialogue, if we can understand best what is each other's interests and objectives, we can collaborate better and so we can, we can reach to action because I think we all want to see results in this, in this near, near future. And uh, my last uh, uh, information is that we learned so much from this uh, experience of working together with stakeholders, some of them part of the bingo 
consortium, others from outside, that at the end we added additional deliverables uh, to the project and we produce four policy briefs that uh, are bringing the results from research to high-level decision makers. And we do believe this was and is a very good contribution from the project. Many thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Anna Estela. And um, I would like now to uh, pass to the next presentation ask um, Francesco Fantone, who is a full professor at the um, Polytechnic University of Marcia. Um, Francesco, we discuss a lot about uh, circular economy, that we have to change the way that we are treating and managing also the water. So what is your experience on circular economy and the potential for water use? Well, thank you very much, Panos, and uh, thanks a lot to the old organizer for this invitation. After four years of project, uh, it's crucial to be here to bring our experience uh, about uh, some keywords. Actually, I was adding keywords to this presentation over the project, and now we have sustainable recovery about technologies, safe reuse about what we are producing, about value in urban water cycle, and which is our challenge to go from concept for technologies to standard practice. Of course, uh, I will highlight the role of the EU funded actions. Uh, in order to show how we are engaging stakeholders, uh, and in the end we, we will see how we were engaged as stakeholders, we innovators, we were engaged by governments uh, as stakeholders to bring our experience. So when we started we were focusing on some challenges, uh, we are researchers, so we were uh, focusing on innovation, and then uh, uh, during the, uh, the months uh, we were highlighting the challenges, uh, and actually if we want to move from uh, linear to circular economy, we have to focus not only on the technical innovation, but we have to think about the operators. Utilities are working in their own environment, and the water sector is very uh, resilient in terms of uptaking of innovation. So in, we have to enable the skills of the operators. We have to work with regulators, not only support policy, and we have to think about retaining the materials of the value that we are recovering in order to keep the value of resources thinking about the resource security that we have to guarantee. These were the challenges that we addressed within Smart Plant. And uh, when we started, uh, we asked the utilities, are you interested in materials recovery? They said, no. The majority of our partners are newcomers, so they were not aware about Horizon 2020. We asked them, are you interested about material recovery and reuse? No, they said, well, I want to treat water and to produce clean water. So this was our first point. And our selling point of, of a smart plant was, first of all, your water quality will be the same or better, and you will have energy efficiency and carbon efficiency, and as added value, you will recover materials. That's why we are upgrading a real plant to recover cellulose, to recover phosphorus, to recover nutrients, to recover biopolymers, polydroxarcanoate, to produce finally materials for the construction industry, like biocomposite, we produce benches, to produce uh, nutrients, to produce biofertilizer, and to address the market in technologies that were verified within the environmental technology verification protocols. This is another hot point of our uh, project where we asked the utilities, do you know ETV? In Brussels, all of them, they said, yes, I know. All over Europe, they said, no, I don't know ETV. So, about ETV, a lot of efforts, but still we have to work a lot. At the end of the project, we cluster with other projects and we produced our policy support paper with other uh, projects working on resource recovery. And uh, we identified the policy and barriers. We were also part in the innovation deal. It was a, a great experience for us. At the moment, we have a circular economy package. We have a new common agricultural policies. We have a new fertilizing products regulation but we still have no apparent willing, willingness of customers to accept it a premium for sustainability. So regulation is the key. And we have a customer reluctance when they think about sewage originated uh, materials uh, when these are declared. Pub public procurement is still uh, focusing on low cost instead of closed loops. And except for fertilizing, still we, we miss end of waste harmonized regulation all around Europe. This is the challenge. So, uh, we try to support uh, the policy, but also the regulation, uh, thinking about uh, our own experience. So, we were thinking about materials recovering by energy efficiency. So, again, water and energy food carbon nexus uh, is a key, and, but sh this should be quantified by evidence and metrics. I like very much the presentation this morning. Uh, and maybe we need some clear targets 
as the ones that were used in the energy directives, and we need more harmonization at EU level. Finally, we need long-term binding agreements. We have to think that the water sector, they have a contract for 10, 20 years. So if they don't have clear long-term binding agreements, they're not going to invest in resource recovery if they cannot circulate this material to the chemical industry, for example. So our, our, after our policy support papers, uh, we were very happy to support the European policy, but uh, we were not uh, happy because we didn't see the impact. And uh, further to the uh, comments from the European Commission, we were interfacing with the national government, and these are our major results, I think. Because this is an example from Italy, we were interfacing uh, uh, and we were engaged as a stakeholder and at the moment you can see the new legislation on sludge management in Italy is providing promotion of cellulose, biopolymer and nutrient and also the new proposal for water tariff is proposing promotion of cellulose, nutrient, biopolymers that is actually what we have planned to demonstrate in smart plans. So our way is support policy directly but also work with the national government to have the other way around support the member states to get two ways to the European policy that is difficult to be harmonized. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Francesco. Um, so uh, after seeing uh, examples of projects which have been funded by it's Horizon 2020, I think it would be also too good to, to see an example from other funding mechanisms uh, at the Commission which also support uh, more practical, I would say, applications. So I have the, the pleasure also to invite uh, Maljor Zatta Pieka from EASME, a project advisor, also to present uh, their activity. Thank you very much. So today I would like to speak to you about the LIFE program, which is a, f a financial instrument to finance, uh, to co-fund co the um, environment, climate, and nature program. And I'm particularly working on the water team, uh, in the water team of environment. Uh, we took over the program, the project uh, from DG Environment, we took over in 2014 and we kind of um, feel uh, responsible since then, fully, we take uh, full responsibility for the projects. They, uh, we cover through the projects virus practically all the possible um, water policies, uh, as you can see. And um, there are different uh, aims of the projects uh, which we are co-financing. So um, if you want to go more into this, I shall be happy to discuss later. What about impacts uh, and follow-up? Um, we have so-called uh, project indicators where the proposals uh, are at the beginning of the, um, each project. Uh, the, um, the beneficiaries are uh, giving the numbers that what they are aiming at, which means the reduction of uh, certain pollutants and so on. So more or less at the beginning, it's just like um, prediction. So, and later on, the, with the, in the progress report, interim report, they are re actually reporting the revalues. At, at the end of the project, uh, they are also telling us what they achieved and what they are planning to achieve within three and five years after the project ends. We use a lot project indicators. We also are in contact with our parent DGs, with the GRC and so on. So because KPIs are the kind of tools which help us to measure the impacts of the project. So we always want to see what the project managed to achieve. We have um, a live project data database in the data hub where you can also have a look to find possible uh, networking possibilities to see successful projects, best practice, those who have already uh, conducted the projects or they are looking for some partners. Uh, we as well have a tool which is called ex post audit, um, which helps us to check what is the possible error rate, which means that what kind of uh, uh, performance is uh, also our agency doing. With, um, we have a monitoring team uh, and um, which is following up the, proposal, the projects in their countries, in the countries of the, of the proposal, which uh, with the monitoring team which speaks the language of the country, which is always the first contact uh, point for the beneficiaries. And uh, we have a live stakeholders workshop which is organized regularly also to help uh, to involve the stakeholders in the live program. 
we have uh, created recently so-called Dental Water Hub, which actually is constructed of, um, is, is composed by different um, monitoring, um, people from the monitoring team, which help us also to look through the programs, which uh, live program is covering not only environment, but also climate and nature. So it means that there are water projects within different teams, also nature and climate, so in a way, we manage to look um, from different perspectives that we don't overlap or we kindly have idea what is happening within the policy or uh, what needs to be done. Uh, as I mentioned, we also have the monitoring team which help us to follow up um, uh, what uh, the impacts uh, and prob possibly to see uh, what are the possible uh, challenges in the water. We request, we want to see after life plans and Lyman's report for each project, so because we want to see if the proposal, if the project will outlast the financial, uh, the, the duration of the project, because we want, don't want to have another project which will end up somewhere in the shelf. So we want to see impacts, we want to see how it will be conducted, what is the transfer, uh, replication, uh, transferability, transferability, that it means that the project will be somewhere replicated, transferred to another sector. We want to go beyond the borders, beyond the regions. We have the close to market initiative, which also we help, we stimulate our beneficiaries to look also at, um, uh, at the, um, aspects, financial aspects of their projects, because we have close to market projects, so we want to see business plans. And if you want to see more, please have a look at our website, come to our live info day, which will be this year in Brussels on the 13th of um, uh, April. And uh, with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. And, um, as it was mentioned um, earlier today, of course, water is a global challenge and global issue. So collaboration across also between also different stakeholders is very important. So I have the pleasure also to invite um, Stephen Sonberg, who is the regional director of the World Bank from Europe and uh, Central Asia, uh, to give us also his perspective and uh, views on innovation in the water area. Thank you, Panos. Uh, I was asked to share our experience in encouraging innovation around the globe and inevitably when you're the last speaker in the last panel at the end of the day, uh, much of what you plan to say has already been presented, but hopefully this presentation will help to capture some of the very good points made earlier and throughout the day. So I wanted to share with you seven uh, areas that we've seen as critical to really creating the kind of innovation uh, ecosystem or space that, that's effective in the water sector. The first one is, and it's been mentioned before, we have to change how people think about water. It has to move from single sectors to multi-sectoral or integrated water management. Uh, agriculture is a good example of that, and I think uh, there was some excellent work done by the uh, previous uh, agricultural commissioner, Phil Hogan, in convincing the G20 agricultural ministers to place agricultural water use in the context of broader basin management. And that's been extremely important. Uh, secondly, we have to move, as, as was mentioned earlier, from a linear approach to a circular approach. I don't have to go further into that. It's been a theme throughout the day. But thirdly, an area where we haven't heard much discussion, but is also an important area or direction of, of travel in the area of water, is moving from centralized to distributed solutions. Uh, when I go to one of our large client countries, one of the things they're most proud of is the fact that they built a wastewater treatment plant that apparently can be seen from space. Uh, when I asked the uh, general manager of the Metropolitan Water District of Los Angeles what his advice would be for a water manager in a developing country, he said, please tell them don't build big, large centralized infrastructure, build decentralized wastewater treatment facilities because that facilitates the reuse process. So there's a huge movement occurring and we need to capture that as, as part of how people think about water. A second area, and it's been mentioned a number of times, is we need to make this a shared agenda amongst stakeholders. And some of the ways we've seen that happen is first of all, never waste a good crisis. Uh, day zero of course comes from the, the uh, water shortages in Cape Town 
And in speaking with the management of, of Cape Town Water, uh, one of whom is now one of our, our former colleagues, is now the general manager, uh, while it was a, a difficult event for the people of Cape Town, it was also an opportunity to address some long-standing limitations or policy uh, barriers to moving water between the agricultural sector and the urban sector when needed or creating water markets or other mechanisms. So we have to take advantage of these crises when everyone is focused on the water agenda. Secondly, we have to diversify who is in the water agenda. Uh, we're doing some work as an example uh, with countries in the Danube and with utilities in the Dan Danube Basin to have a more diverse workforce so that when people look at water managers and the water industry, they see themselves. And that engages them more and makes it a more familiar and comfortable space to engage. And of course, we've discussed, and there's some excellent representatives here from the important role of youth and, and youth voices as part of the water movement. Another area that we found is extremely important is really getting water professionals to the cutting edge. Uh, when I say water professionals, uh, I'm talking about uh, government officials working in water, utility officials, but also the staff of agencies like the World Bank and the consultants we use. Um, I often find that we get stuck in a certain knowledge at a certain point of time and then we're focusing on administrative aspects, whether they were government or, or, or uh, funding agencies, and we miss all the progress that's happening in the industry. So we try and support that in a number of ways. We have study tours which we sponsor in which we bring people from around the world as, as well as our staff to see innovations. The picture here is from a visit to uh, the Netherlands where we were able to see their very innovative uh, approaches including living with floods and other aspects. Uh, we also uh, encourage our staff and, and help uh, government officials go to trade shows. Uh, like this, it's a place to really find out what's happening in industry and engage directly. And then thirdly, we support a lot of peer exchanges, uh, utility manager to utility manager. I brought people from different utilities around the world to the Middle East and vice versa, and that's been very valuable. Fourth area is, of course, the support of regulation, which has been mentioned before. Uh, clearly, the European Union is making some tremendous advances with, uh, and it was discussed earlier by uh, Veronica regarding water reuse. Uh, and that's creating a sense of confidence uh, amongst member states to be able to pursue that activity. On the other hand, regulation also has to be bottom up. And an example is that the United States Environmental Protection Agency recently came out with their action plan for reuse, uh, but it's way behind what's happening at the local level. The state of Texas is already doing direct potable reuse. The state of California is way ahead in regulating on-site building-specific, neighborhood-specific reuse. Uh, another area is, of course, harnessing the, the energy of the private sector, which we've heard about. And the private sector can do it. Some quick examples, uh, Senegal and uh, Manila, where they've really used PPPs to be able to reach difficult-to-reach populations. Often there's a criticism the private sector will not reach the poor. In fact, if the contracts are structured correctly, it can be the best way to reach the poor. And, and we've seen that over and over again where they've been able to access difficult rural communities or difficult to access slums and actually develop a good water service. Similarly, we see a lot of innovation coming from some of the leading country, uh, companies in Europe and other places. Uh, the sixth is, of course, procurement. And I didn't know that Isle Utilities was going to be a uh, facilitator here. But Isle plays an important role in really helping to link utilities to innovation and, and reducing that search cost and helping them build confidence in, 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 the, uh, in the potential uh, technologies. At the same time, uh, we see utilities banding together and doing this amongst themselves in many cases to, again, pool their efforts to discover and test new technologies. And finally, as a World Bank, and it was mentioned recently, uh, Procurement can be a real impediment if it's not done right. So often we have very traditional tenders with very set uh, specifications that don't allow an interaction with the industry to discover new and innovative approaches. So we've revised our procurement framework to allow for those kind of interactive approaches, and I'd be happy to discuss that more with, with people later on. Finally, and uh, this is, uh, again, something that reiterates what others have mentioned, uh, we have to make innovation a source of public pride. Uh, green infrastructure was mentioned a number of times. The beauty of green infrastructure is that for the water, we often say the problem is that the pipes are under the ground, people don't see how their service is being delivered. 
Green infrastructure puts it right in front of them, whether it's permeable pavements, uh, constructed wetlands, rooftop gardens. These are things that the public can engage with and be proud of, and then they become a part of the innovation process. Also making it familiar uh, with going out into schools and dealing with young people. And finally, this example from Chennai I find fascinating where they require every building to capture rainwater, that rainwater is used for ground, directly goes into groundwater recharge. And the manager of the Chennai Water always says, what's so important about that besides managing the, the aquifer is that it really makes everybody in the city of Chennai a participant in managing their water resources. So with that, I'll finish. Thank you very much. So thank you very much. I, I have to say that that was my most favorite uh, session of the day. I love the, the, the sort of celebration of the results and the work that's come through. We're a little pushed on time, and in a few minutes, Panos is going to come and, and give the final um, talk. But I'm, I've got one question for each of you, if, that's, uh, if you'll give me the liberty. Um, so, well, let's start with you, Werner. Um, you had a hole in your data. You mentioned quite rightly that you can't monitor everything, and so you need to do modeling. So tell me, how do you get yourself confident that your modeling is robust? Ah, works. It's alive. Oh. <laughs> well, uh, this, is a, this is a difficult question, of course, but what we did is uh, to do uh, a validation. So the, the, the modeling is based just on emission data, on, uh, on production and emission and use data. So it's not validated from, from, okay. from the scratch. And uh, the modeling is, of course, only as good as the data, data are you in. feed in. And I think this is still the big gap. So we do not have uh, sufficient data on production, on use, and so on. So more transparency, I think that's the first message. But based on what we have, uh, uh, we did this uh, modeling and uh, did, of course, a comparison with what we found uh, with monitoring. And there you saw that uh, I think within, uh, uh, well, 60% uh, of the data were within two orders of magnitude. So there is still, no, you, That's you pretty see, wide, there is still, I, that feels still, like a big, big ground. still a lot of uncertainty there, and the rest is even outside. But if you, uh, if you have a look on uh, the differences between different compounds with respect to risks, for example, where, we, where you have seven, eight orders of magnitude in between sometimes, then you see it already helps. It already helps to identify additional compounds we really should have a look at in monitoring, for example. Uh, it helps to identify areas where we should have a deeper look in uh, uh, with monitoring. That's, uh, that's uh, what we can do with it. We cannot directly, uh, let's say, predict concentrations we find there. So it's not a replacement okay. of monitoring, but it helps to direct the monitoring better and to save money in order to put the finger where it's necessary. All right, thank you very much. Can you pass the microphone over? Anna, um, so I took away from yours three messages. I took away that R&D must be based in real life, that management and governance must be adaptive, and the power of communication. So I'm going to ask you to pick one. Which is the most important? This is a little bit like what we have been uh, uh, watching in the discussion before. I think that sometimes we like so much to make a ranking of things that we missed integration because in several issues... So which one is, which one has, needs the most work then? Let me put it that way. Which one needs the most work? Where are we furthest away from... Needs the much work, okay. What we realize from these four years of experience is that sometimes we have already the organizations, we have the policies, but we fail into the practice because we are missing these dialogues, these interactive dialogues, and we are missing a mindset that tells us that in spite of lacking some resources or time, we still can do a lot. Because sometimes we get stopped by climate change is uncertain, we don't have all the resources, and if we stick to these um, shortcomings, 
we cannot go for move forward and we can always move forward and this is a message because we realize that even with the climate change predictions being uncertain and that we have different levels of resources all the stakeholders engaged in bingo could find the adaptation solutions for their problems excellent thank you francisco I think that's my favorite project in the world. I love it. The whole circular economy. And 26 partners, I can't even begin to imagine what that was like to manage. I thought you hit the nail on the, the head with that. One of our difficult problems is public procurement always goes for the lowest cost. So how do we get past that? I can only see two solutions, taxation and legislation, or we've got to get even better at innovation so that the cost of doing the circular economy is the lowest cost. Is there another way? And if not, which of those two is the answer? Yeah, we are 27 partners, not 26. <laughs> but, uh, I think that the key is the regulation. Uh, I started my presentation saying, uh, uh, we asked the utilities, are you interested in uh, materials recovery? They said no. After this new regulation in Italy, if you ask them again, they will say yes, of course. So. Uh, Water sector is heavily regulated, and if something is just promoted in regulation, there is no obligation there. They will be interested because with regulation, you can find a way to get this material recovery promoted even in public tenders. In the end, utilities are doing the public tenders, and authorities are doing the regulation. So once this is there, and of course, it's uh, um, policy support, but re regulation uh, integration. This is the challenge that actually we, are, we have delivered uh, in Italy, but we are supporting European Commission as well. And I think it's probably fair to say that regulation should drive up the cost because you know what, the cheap linear solutions are cheap and linear because they haven't built in the real cost of the environment. Don't you think? But yes, we're aligned, we're agreed. <laughs> All right, Malgazata. Um, what I most loved about your presentation, there were so many things I liked about it, was the post um, the, the post-project audit, and you said, you teased us, you teased us with, we do this to find out how many of them fail. And I was hanging and going, oh, I wonder if she's going to tell us. So how many of them do fail? Because surely failure actually is an important part of innovation. We expect a certain degree of them to fail, because if they don't, you know what, we probably haven't been innovative enough. So how many fail? How many by numbers? We have some termination cases when we see that project is not progressing well. So, but we, you, you know, you kill them before they get there. Well, yeah. they commit a suicide. <laughs> <laughs> if not, we help. <laughs> no, no. But jokes apart, of course, there are projects uh, which unfortunately have to be terminated. But it's really low percentage. Uh, mostly we help them also to perform well because especially what i said we have the, they have the monitoring team it's a monitoring team which help us to follow up closely on the regular basis but it also helps the beneficiaries because it's uh, someone who is in their country who speaks their language and for any kind of help they can contact them so and what I said, the, um, the, we, we check them post audit yes sometimes we send the auditors to check to go through the financial documents. So, so far, we are lucky. Error rate, zero. Zero. That For is the lucky. Time being. Because you've killed them before they've got there. That's no, why. I wouldn't say that we, can, we are picky during the, uh, let's say, project implementation. We help them, guide them, like, look, guys, at the final report, you might have these costs not recognized because you don't provide, I don't know, sufficient documentation. So they know. And they get ready. So that's why, at the end, we want to pay, and we can pay. Brilliant. Brilliant. All right, then we come to Stephen. Now, I challenge anyone in the audience. He, said, he gave us the warning at the beginning. He said, I'm going to give you seven points. And I thought, I'm going to see if I can follow the seven points. I bet you none of them, no one can remember the seven points in fully. So I'm going to recap them. Check, change how people think. Make it a shared agenda. Get the water professionals to the cutting edge. Can you remember what the fourth one was? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> now that wasn't good, was it? We should have rehearsed this beforehand. Supportive legislation, clear financing, procure to incentivize, and public pride. It's a little like the unfair question I gave Anna, but of those seven, 
which is the one that we need to put the most work into? Yeah, I, w I was really impressed by Francesco because as a researcher, he, I think he nailed it pretty well. I think, and I'm going to give two because I'm just going to give two. Uh, but he mentioned both of them. I think the regulation, because it creates sort of that sense of confidence. The biggest concern we have in the water business, and Isle Utilities is one of the ones that's... I'm sorry, I'm giving a lot of shout-outs here. People are going to think I'm... It's very good. I'm I, sponsored I was already in love with this session before you, you, you <laughs> name-checked my company, but uh, you've just that's made it. me love it even more. But, you know, as we know, the, the, you know there's a, a, a conservatism that needs to be in... Because we're talking about, really, the water... As, as um, George Hawkins, who was the extraordinary general manager of DC Water, used to say, I'm not in the water business, I'm in the health business. So you have to be extremely cautious when you're in the health business. You're talking about people's well-being on a day-to-day -day basis. So as a result, people need to get confidence that they can move into these innovative spaces. Regulation gives them, if you wish, the legal coverage to be able to do that so that there's not a tremendous responsibility. If something does go wrong, they can at least say, well, the regulations permit it. Uh, secondly, and I, I, it's also the procurement, as I mentioned and as Francesco mentioned, because even within the regulatory space, Traditional procurement just isn't getting us there. You guys are helping out with that. We're helping out with it with innovative procurement uh, frameworks. Brilliant. Thank you very much. We've run out of time. Could we give this excellent panel a round of applause, please? And could you take your seats back in the audience? That was brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. So um, I'd like to invite Panos back to the podium to give the last major speech of the day. Um, Panos? The floor is all yours. Thank you, Piers, and thank you also for <coughs> helping also in uh, the discussion session. So this gave me also some uh, time also to brief and prepare also this presentation. I know that this is quite late, but I think it would be important. I will not um, uh, spend much of the time, but I would like through this short presentation also to give you a short update. Where are we uh, in Horizon Europe and also um, more uh, uh, importantly also to highlight, you know, the opportunities which are offered within also the water sector. And as you know, uh, investment in research and innovation has been and always a, a big priority at the European Commission. And this is, of course, because many studies also, the impact assessments done on the previous pro projects shows also the importance of uh, the benefits, the added value of investing at the European, uh, uh, at the EU level. Um, trying also to demonstrate also benefits to make uh, international cooperation also very important, trying also to attract, you know, the best uh, researchers, but also on the other hand also provide also re uh, uh, outputs, uh, results, which can be very useful for uh, policy updates and also help uh, uh, to strengthen also the scientific basis of our policies. So having this in mind, also the Commission proposed already at the end of 2018 a very ambitious uh, in terms of funding um, um, uh, framework program. This is called the Horizon Europe. This is going to um, uh, cover the next uh, seven years from 21 to 27. And uh, as I said, this is a very ambitious pro uh, funding. Of course, nowadays, of course, there is a lot of discussion uh, and uh, uh, about the next financial um, uh, perspective from the European Union. And it could be that this uh, also um, proposal, Commission proposal, is affected depending on the overall uh, funding that the member states uh, and the Parliament also will uh, agree at the end of the day. But nevertheless, I think this is an important uh, and ambitious program. Um, this is not something new uh, regarding to the previous um, framework promise in the Horizon 2020. So you uh, see here, let's say, the main um, uh, focuses, you know, strengthening, as I mentioned, the EU scientific and technological basis, um, boosting also the um, European innovation capacity, uh, helping also industries, the competitiveness of the Europe's and the creation of jobs. But the last point, I think, is one of the key elements and I think something which has been more um, uh, pronounced and with some key elements in Horizon Europe is to not only make pro pro uh, make knowledge and provide also knowledge, but trying also to provide solutions, try to deliver to the citizens' priorities and also to show also the impact. Here, as you can see, is the, the, the structure of Horizon Europe. Um, several of you probably will recognize is not something new with comparison to the, uh, uh, to the Horizon 2020. So this 
uh, structure in three pillars when we have the pillar one, which is more the fundamental, the science-driven, you know, um, bottom-up type of appro approaches. Then we have the pillar two. I think this is one of the important uh, pillars where collaborative research also between also uh, universities, between industries, between end users, and also trying also to address the challenges. We have the global challenges we're going to face. And then we have the pillar three, which is now more about what we call the, the open innovation, the innovation component. This is more about also SMEs, about how to create also a favorable environment also to boost also the market uptake. Uh, in terms of the budget distribution, as you can see here, let's say most of the half of the money is going to this what we call collaborative type of approaches, but I think still the other pillars, uh, already the innovation pillar has 13.5 billion and 25.8 billion also used for um, the uh, um, open, what we call the open science, the bottom up, the European Research um, Council. Um, here is another, I think, one of the novelties, what we call this is the European Innovation Council, is something that we try to do, the equivalent, for instance, uh, of the European Research Council uh, for the SMEs from the um, uh, innovators. Here is uh, helping also innovators also to, to create the market also of the future. And here you have, let's say, two main instruments. One is, you know, the, what we call the Pathfinder, which is uh, more about grants, about uh, for any type of technological development. This is more uh, any technology to pre-commercial type of activities. But then we have also the accelerator, which is, is grants, but also in this blended financing mechanism also to help also to go more to the market to scale up also the different also innovation. Another also a characteristic of, um, uh, important characteristic of Horizon Europe, I think this is the introduction, the introduction of what we call missions. And I think this is something which um, uh, is also meant to be um, as a kind, of, uh, um, a kind of a portfolio of actions, um, which is goes also ag across disciplines um, in order also to achieve what we call a kind of a a target a goal which could be also very important what we call a bold uh, inspirational goal but on the other time also is also to be also measurable uh, and this is also something to be um, created uh, in a specific also time frame so in order also that people also can really trace and to achieve and to see to what exa exactly uh, we are also to what, in what path we are and what, to what extent we are ready also to achieve uh, our mission. And this is something which is going to be also um, um, uh, um, uh, co-designed um, uh, together also with the member states, with stakeholders and the citizens, um, but also I will come a bit later about this co-design which is also an important feature of the um, Horizon Europe. Another thing, more, I would say more novelty is these part, uh, partnerships, the European partnerships. Um, as you know, um, uh, uh, partnerships have been already promoted since several years. The idea of the partnership have been more to bring together um, uh, funding the uh, organizations, the funding mechanisms, in particular member states funding with the European funding, and trying also to create also more favorable um, uh, um, frameworks also for joint investments, but on the other hand, trying also to address the fragmentation. We, and this is also, we speak about that, about water. This is also an area which is very fragmented, and this is also the, something also very relevant for water, and also I will mention. So where are we now? As you said, this is um, a commission proposal has been um, in 2019 uh, debated, you know, in 18 and 19 in the Council and the, um, um, and, and the European Parliament. Still, the final uh, adoption is still um, pending, but there is what we call a kind of uh, um, uh, a partial general agreement between also the, um, the three institutions. Uh, um, so based on that, so the Commission also um, um, worked uh, in the creation of what we call a kind of um, strategic pr um, priority plan. And this is um, uh, a kind of plan to define 
a kind of multi-annual work program. And this is also one of the uh, particular also uh, future uh, to, of the Horizon Europe is trying also to have a more transparent and also more tra strategic way of um, planning also our research activities and also creating also the, um, the work programs, you know, the topics um, um, for the course. And this is very important um, uh, planning because for the first time also bring together also trying to bring also the silos within the Commission services is for the first time different policy also DGs in addition also to the RTD came together also from the early stage to discuss uh, in a co-design, co co um, co-creation also mode also the um, priorities and trying also to align and the link also the scientific priorities with the policy needs. And then this strategic planning also have been um, uh, open to uh, open consultations to the public and also to, to, the, to the member states. So there have been a series of public consultation th uh, two hours uh, the, through the whole beginning of 2019. And this th has been a kind of culmination of this um, uh, stakeholder discussions and involvement in, early, in end of September, when we have the first called European Research and Innovation Days, where um, these uh, elements of the strategic planning have been also debated and discussed um, uh, across the different, also with the different stakeholders. Let me then go a bit now uh, more more details about you know the relevance, how water is is um, uh, um, uh, represented and what are the perspect for, uh, perspective also and the perspective for water research in this uh, structure. Um, of course, we have recognized that there are different clusters and of course, water is not only relevant to this particular cluster six, uh, water is also relevant also for the health cluster, is also uh, the health pollution issues are very important. Um, cluster is also relevant also for the um, disaster also cluster, about security cluster. This is also about uh, floods, about the uh, security of our uh, infrastructure, water infrastructure are important. But I would like more to focus on this particular cluster six because I think this is, you can recognize this is um, a cluster which is trying also to bring together um, different also um, cross-cutting areas um, about the food, about agriculture, about bioeconomy, about uh, natural resources in environment. This is for the first time that trying also to have a more, let's say, um, uh, um, approach trying to address the, the linkages between also these um, um, uh, challenges. And also one of the characteristics of this cluster is that we also try um, not only to um, look on the uh, scientific cross-cutting dimension, but also trying also to link also this program with major uh, um, European programs and also the sustainable development goals. This is, of course, a sustainability is a, a, a characteristic across the horizon Europe, but this is also particularly important um, for um, uh, the cluster six. And of course, um, um, uh, the recent also new political priorities, in particular part of the Green Deal, dealing with climate change, the biodiversity, the new circular economy, the zero pollution um, ambition are also um, relevant in this um, cluster. Here you can see the, um, there are seven intervention areas um, in this um, uh, cluster. And then I will go very rapidly just to, to highlight, you know, some specific uh, water-related issues which are going to be across this, um, these priorities. I think um, in environmental observation, many uh, um, of you mentioned to today the, the importance of um, uh, um, data, trying also to have a robust um, uh, analysis about availability uh, of uh, about water resources. But I think um, one of the main problems nowadays that is uh, uh, we lack a, a, a strong uh, information about the water use. And I think there, this is we have also to benefit from uh, earth observation, the, uh, all these opportunities of environmental observation to increase also um, uh, not only about water availability, but also about water use, this information. Um, the intervention areas of biodiversity, as you can see, this is um, also will have a strong um, uh, water-related uh, um, uh, um, action, in particular also 
the linkages between all ecosystem services, water pollution, uh, also natural based solutions. These are also going also to, to look there. Um, under the intervention area, agriculture, forest and rural area, of course, um, it was mentioned agriculture is one of the uh, most important um, water uh, use sector uh, uh, also in Europe but also worldwide and in particular also in some southern part of, of the Europe. So this is important uh, um, to um, trying also to look how to better um, enhance also the water use efficiency in agriculture but also related to the nutrients management. This is also an important also um, uh, dimension and when we also would like to look about the adaptation of our production uh, um, to the climate change, water also is an important com component and has to be also seen. Um, inland water, fresh water has been also linked very strongly to the, um, this intervention area, sea oceans and inland water, so this is also a sign to try to have continuum between, you know, the land-based, you know, um, um, water also resources and also the link also to the sea oceans, so this is very important about also the pollution, I think the, the zero pollution ambition. Um, has also to look very strongly uh, about that and, and I think this is um, uh, issues relating about the uh, monitoring methods, about you know, the new emerging pollutions. Um, these are important elements also to be looked there. Um, in the food system intervention area, this is also issues related to the, um, um, uh, the, interle the uh, interlinkages between you know, uh, food production about biodiversity, water systems. So these interlinkages also will be um, also um, looked there. There we have two other intervention areas, the bio-based innovation systems. So there are issues related to the bio, sustainable biomass production and water use. And then in the intervention area or circular systems, so this would be also a key intervention area where we'd like also to strengthen more the opportunities of um, circular economy to try and also to um, uh, put also some bold issues to create, for instance, some uh, climate neutral, also urban um, uh, water systems uh, where also circular economy will be also an important um, uh, driver for achieving this climate. Uh, neutrality, but there are also issues related to the uh, sustainability of uh, nutrients management, but also the issue about, you know, the, the governments, governance solutions, both for circular economy, but the circular use of water will be also very important. But beyond the, um, the specific activity, I would like also to come back to this mission, um, uh, where, as you can see here, these are the five missions which have been already agreed between the Commission and the, um, and the member states, and they have been also, um, uh, um, also reinforced in the stakeholders consultation. And as you can see, five out of the uh, uh, four out of the five missions you would agree with me with are uh, water related so of course uh, these are missions now are under discussion for each mission there is a mission board uh, and there are also um, uh, a lot of um, uh, stakeholders uh, um, consultations to define exactly because these are mission areas so we have to come with specific um, priorities but there are also in, in the preliminary discussion both I think in soil also in uh, climate adaptation and ocean uh, we are very confident that water related issue will be also um, important and then Last, I would like also to um, also give um, this um, another also important element for water also research is about this uh, partnership portfolio. As you can see here, there has been a very broad portfolio of European partnerships which have been also proposed. Um, and then as you can see in, in red under cluster six, um, water for all is uh, one of the um, uh, potentials also uh, partnerships which are proposed and the idea there is as you can see is to try also to bring together um, uh, the different um, um, uh, funders uh, at the uh, national lev level together also with the commission but also to um, provide also incentive also to the private sector to try also to come together um, to address let's say the new emerging challenges 
uh, trying also to better also coordinate also our activities and also to try also to, as I said, to um, um, uh, try to, um, uh, to build also, um, uh, also um, water, secure water, um, not only for our also um, planet, but also for our citizens, for our, our nature, and also for, for our economy. Um, here, as you can see, is uh, just for information what is the indicative um, time uh, um, uh, timing now for the uh, finalization of this um, um, exercise. So we are now hoping by the end of this year also to finalize what we call the strategic um, uh, planning. And then um, based on that, uh, with now also this, we are also expecting also the new commission um, also to have a final also view and uh, um, to give also the adoption. And then based on that, we are proposing also to start already preparation of the draft work programs in the next year in order hoping that by before the end of the year, the final adoption of this horizon will take place also by co-legislator, the council and the parliament, and then to be also in advance um, to um, um, uh, also be ready for launching also the first call for 2021. Let me then um, just uh, as um, a way of a conclusion also um, just to highlight also two, uh, three messages that um, uh, um, uh, we have also to guide also water research and innovation under Horizon Europe. Um, uh, as it was also mentioned, um, uh, and I think this is also in line with uh, our discussion today, that um, trying also to this water research and innovation how has to make also a next step have not to look on traditional ways of um, uh, doing research and innovation, but also to uh, trying also to look on solutions to the emerging challenges that we are going to face in the upcoming decades. I think there are already a lot of information to uh, uh, um, uh, um, treat also the current problems, but we have to look uh, forward looking and so we have also to um, uh, look to these more emerging policies. And then I think what is also very important is that this also research should also, uh, has also an, a, a focus on, on, on policies, trying also to already have in advance also how research and innovation can also develop, you know, the evidence-based in which also policy measures also um, uh, can be also um, uh, uh, looked at. What is also important, I think, that this um, water research and innovation should not be just uh, a funding of research program, but we have also to use also this funding in order also to strengthen also uh, collaboration, to mobilize also additional investments. I think in regional and national level, um, one of the key elements of the um, Horizon Europe is also the synergies between funding mechanisms. So uh, uh, how to better also look the synergies between also structural funds, uh, life programs, other also funding mechanisms should be also very important. In the last point I would like also to, to mention this is that also um, our research in water should uh, be also what we call systemic and, and transform it. Um, also to look more on the transition also to sustainability and also, um, also trying also to help also to address some of the challenges that the Green Deal uh, is also going to, to, to be. So the, the, the room is there, I think the opportunity is there, so I hope that you will be the ones that to make this happen. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, that was a very good summary. Thank you. Um, right, we're coming to the closing session. Um, thank you, everyone, for hanging in there. Um, I, I couldn't begin to capture everything that has, has gone on today and all of the key messages. Um, Take-home messages, what are we all thinking? What, how are we going to leave today? What are the main uh, thoughts um, that we've captured? Luckily, we've had Blanca here today um, capturing many of those messages, and I really encourage you all to take a look at her fantastic artwork. It's been displayed just as you leave that exit. It's on the wall. Um, I've been taking photos of them. There's so many great details. I don't know how you 
capture everything that's said so well, but please, please have a look at them because they're fantastic. Um, we've also um, had, I mentioned at the beginning of the day, the young water professionals. So we've had Marina and Hoke capturing the key messages from today. And I would actually like um, to invite Marina to the stage. I can't, ah, oh, there she is. And she's going to just in a couple of minutes really um, give us something to think about. So what, what are the key messages that have come out today? What have we learned? Um, and what is our take home for tomorrow and for the future? So Marina, over to you. Thank you. OK. Um. Well, first of all, thank you very much for this opportunity for us to participate, given our, our perspective as, as young water professionals. Uh, I think it's been a long day. We've listened to many, to many things, many discussions, many ideas. So what we've tried to do is to just focus on, on some of the concepts that have called our attention and then provide some feedback on some things that, that we think are, are relevant, again, from the young water professional perspective. Um, first of all, I would like to say that there's been other EIB water conferences, but that we think that this one is special, right? Uh, there's the COP25, there's the Green Deal um, that, that is on place. And as we speak, there's a global movement on the street that is, that is trying to foster a greener future. So if there has been a moment to understand the potential importance of conferences like this one, it's now. Um, Beyond this, um, I, would like to, I would like to say that um, well, some of the ideas that have been going around today are around complexity. There's this idea that as, as a water sector, we cannot think in a silo anymore, that we are inevitably linked to other sectors, that we are linked to society, and that this, of course, is not the way that we have been working up until now. So this adds a layer of complexity to the way that we have been okay, conducting the business. This, um, to this complexity, we can add the uh, climate change challenges. And, and when this happens, you understand that, that we think that innovation has never been as important as today. So uh, going, going back to the debate that we were having, we're one of those Cristobal Columbus type of, of people, that we think that innovation is absolutely essential. Um, so then, from a young water professional perspective, we have to say that we expect and we hope that the policies, that the mechanisms that are coming in place today, the Green Deal and all the policies that are connected, all the innovation mechanisms that are, that are joined to that, are going to help accelerate, they're going to foster, and they, they're going to enable this innovation that we really need in Europe. It's, it's no secret that, that uh, as far as innovation goes from a, from a general perspective, uh, Europe has fallen a little bit behind China, the United States, and so on. So I think now is the moment that we are implementing all these policies, that we are implementing these mechanisms, that we are revising the way that, that we think about innovation in the water sectors and other sectors, that we need to make sure that we can bring this one home. Um, from the private sector perspective, uh, I think we've seen striking examples of how companies are, are becoming greener and, more, and actually more, more water sensitive, more water sensible. Um, I think this is, and we think from the young water professionals that this is very important. Actually, uh, many of us work in companies, work in the private sector, I'm an example. So I'm, uh, I'm also, you know, part of this transformation. We're seeing it from the inside. But we want, to, we want to send out this message to the leadership in the companies and say that we want them to take uh, a further step forward. And we want them to, to try and abandon all those business models that are intrinsically not sustainable. When we are thinking about the water sector, of course, we are referring, for instance, to, to the business of bottled water. It makes no sense to us that there's a business like transporting water in plastic in, in countries and in places where there's very excellent uh, drinking water services. I, we know that it's complex, we know that it's difficult, but I, we also think that the, this needs to be done. Uh, finally, when we talk about innovation, we're not only thinking about the technical, we're not only thinking about the processes and the mechanism, we're also thinking about how we collaborate. 
um, there's a need to start collaborating in different ways with different sectors, with the society. There needs to be a closer collaboration too between the private and the public sectors. And this is going to take some, you know, innovation, different ways of thinking about alliances. Um, this, of course, is going out a little bit out of, of our comfort zone, but I think that it, it is essential, it is the future. Uh, to close, let me tell you that, you know, we, we've sent some messages, and, and I think they're clear enough, but that as, as young water professionals and as people who work in, in the water sector in Europe, um, we understand the challenges, we understand how difficult it is to, to achieve many of the things that have been presented today and, and some of the things that I've mentioned, but that we are optimistic about the, about the present and about the future. You can definitely count on us, you, we are your young water workforce, and we are here to help you to achieve these goals, and we are definitely willing to lead and to take home this vision. Thank you. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you. Marina, thank you. That was really, really great. And I think you've pulled so many different themes that have run through the day together and built on them and left us all with a sort of clear vision of, of what we've covered and where we need to go. So thank you very much. And what I'd like to do now is I'd like to invite to the stage Mr. Alona, the Ministry, uh, Minister for Agriculture, Mr. Mindenes, Menendez, sorry, um, uh, and uh, Veronica Manfredi to come up and give the final um, thank yous. And the directors of the water innovation sector, it's an honor for me to close this wonderful day full of ideas and inspiration. Thanks to Guido Smith and this team for the great uh, work. Thanks for the partners. Thanks for the sponsors who made possible this event. Thanks for the speakers. I propose an applause for the speakers. Well done. And also of the artists. <laughs> Thanks to the European Commission, especially to Veronica Manfredi, for your work, Veronica, and for your passion. <laughs> the passion is necessary. Please be sure that we are in line with the European Green Deal. Uh, contribution to this Green Deal is my own political ambition. Contribution to this contribution, the Green Deal, is the ambition of the Governor de Aragón. As our president Lamban said this morning, we wanted to refresh the spirit of the Expo 28 on water and sustainability. Thanks again for showing us a host to this conference. It confirms we were right. I hope that the results of the today answers of the slide uh, improve as soon as possible. I am sure we will cross our paths soon in further joint actions. Thank you very much. Well, if you go now to, to Madrid to the COP25 uh, and visit the, the Spanish pavilion, you are going to see a very big uh, banner saying ambition, uh, only one word, ambition. And I think this word has been mentioned a lot of times uh, today here. Uh, for example, this morning, uh, Daniel Calleja told uh, us about the ambition of the Green Deal. Just five minutes ago, Panayotis Balabanis uh, were talking about the ambition of the new program uh, Horizon Europe. Just now, Joaquin Olona has told about the ambition uh, on behalf of the uh, Aragon government. And I think that uh, has been mentioned many, many times uh, this morning and, uh, and this afternoon. And talking about water and talking about uh, ambition, uh, let me say that uh, maybe the, the, the Water Framework Directive was the, is 
de, 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 de peace of law, uh, the environmental law more ambitious ever. And, uh, this is my opinion. And uh, well, we was also mentioned here today the, the fitness check of the Water Framework Directive that was uh, published yesterday. Um, let me say that from the, 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 the Spanish uh, point of view, uh, we should not reduce the ambition of the Water Framework Directive. In, in, in our opinion, uh, the Water Framework Directive is flexible enough uh, to can deal with the challenges uh, after 2027. And I think we think that uh, there is no need for uh, modification in, in the law. Well, if you go to the COP25, uh, you are not going only to see ambition in the Spanish public. You are going to see a lot of banners about that is time for action, because time for action is the motto of the of the of the COP25. Uh, I'm sure that uh, today uh, uh, Europe has uh, shown here that uh, uh, regarding innovation and regarding uh, water policies, uh, Europe is, is acting. Europe is not losing time. I, I, I think so. So thank you, thank you for for showing this, and, and thank you very much for for your attention. Thank you. Difficult to speak as the last after everything has been said, but next to the thanks that this time go not only to the Aragon government, the Spanish government that has been managing to deal with the huge COP25 and this very successful conference at the same time. They also go to my own team, uh, Hans Stilstra, Emilia, Guido, of course, that I now consider part of my team as well, Alfonso, through the, all the colleagues that have made this possible. I don't repeat all the other thanks. I think with this conference we have achieved one very important objective, which is we are starting to all see what are the key problems in front of us, and we start designing together the solutions. So Marina said it just a minute ago, this conference has been different. Count on us to, for the next water conference to be even more different because it will be sparkling out of the solutions that we will have co-designed. You have heard everything about the immense opportunities that European Union is offering in terms of co-funding possibilities. I was really enthused by the presentation of the colleague of research and innovation showing to us how many strands we have, life, and all the other programs that we have in our hands. The presence of colleagues from the World Bank, from the United Nations throughout the day show how much we are not alone on this path. So as I said at the very beginning, Together, we can only succeed. Thank you for having been with us throughout the day. Thank you. So, I, I just between, um, well, uh, final closing housekeeping, I just wanted to, to make a couple of final points. Um, firstly, in the spirit of innovation, there is a, another event that's been organized. It's the Water Innovation Europe 2020 um, conference. It takes place from the 17th to the 18th of June next year, and it's in Brussels. And the preliminary theme that seems to be coming through for that is a green deal for, water, for a water smart society. So that's really a date to put in everyone's diaries. Um, also, the, if you could one final um, time go onto the Slido, the organizers would really appreciate if you could um, complete the survey. There's a few evaluation questions that will help to plan for, for future events and such like. Um, also, we are trying to be sustainable, so please could all of you leave your lanyards behind at the exit before you leave, unless you want to visit the aquarium. So anyone can, that wants to go to the, the local aquarium here, then take your lanyard with you, your badge, and you will have free entry to there. And there's also a gift um, uh, for you all to take home, so again, feel free to pick that up as you leave. Um, and finally, we'd like to invite you to the networking drinks, which takes place just outside of the auditorium. 
And really finally, a huge thank you um, from both Piers and myself for your participation today. Um, it's been a really great day and we're wishing you all a safe travels home and, and thank you. And before you do, stop, stop. Before you do, I want to beg you to give us just five more minutes because we have a very special surprise for you. I'm going to ask Fermin Serrano to come and join me up here. This event could not have happened without the work of Fermin. He has acted as the bridge that's created this. He's worked with the local host and all the organizers, and he has a very special treat for you. And I don't want to steal your thunder. It's yours to share. Well, thank you very much. Just uh, last thing before we go to the networking to get some fresh air and inspiration, I have to admit one of my passion is the silo-breaking collaboration between scientists, artists, technologists, and humanists. So please consider to include an artist in your research team. In this case, we are including a music performance uh, in the EU Week conference. And I invite the musicians, the guitar group from the Higher Conservatory of Music of Aragon. Por favor, uh, un plaza, a big applause for the guitar players. They are going to play a music composition called uh, Cuban Landscape with Rain by Leo Brower. Please, por favor, los músicos. Gracias. Thanks. Thanks.
Thank you all. That really was a tremendous performance. We thoroughly enjoyed that. Thank you. Okay, so that concludes everything. Let's uh, go and grab a drink and safe travels to everyone um, home. Thank you again.